Okay, everyone. Um, today we're going to talk about efficient uh, diversification. Uh, this is a really important concept. Um, and I listed uh, some learning objectives from CFA and uh, CFE curriculum. Um, in FRM, it's just a lot of math related to it. Um, it's tested everywhere, even though I just listed only two. Okay. Um, and CFA level three is um, a, a large part is about uh, understand diversification and how to apply that. It aligns with CFP. Okay, let's get started. Uh, the whole idea is fairly simple. Okay, so let's start with return first, right? We talk about risk and return um, calculations and that's why uh, this is when we're going to use it. A uh, return is just a weighted function of two portfolios, right? If you have portfolio one, portfolio two, you have uh, $20, $80, and then this is a return, right? Let's say 10% and then 2%. So you can just simply uh, weight them just by your assets, right? It's called a value weighted. It's fairly simple. However, the variance can does not equal to uh, the simple weight, right? Like, so this is a variance of your portfolio. It does not equal to, okay, so that's, it does not generally equal to. So that's why, uh, that's why this becomes interesting and necessary to spend some time. That's why Marco Whiskey won Nobel Prize in Economics because of this. So what he said is, uh, look, this is the function we all know, right? So if you have two assets, and then um, the variance of the portfolio should have a function of correlation, okay? Or like the whole part is a covariance, right? Covariance of S asset one and asset two. So and then I use uh, S stands for stock, B stands for bonds, right? You can just change this to a stock bond. It's the same thing, okay? Um, this is how we calculate correlation, and this is how covariance is. Is that making sense mathematically? Okay. So the takeaway is the return is always the weighted uh, return of two assets. The risk is smaller than the weighted risk of uh, two assets because we don't have perfect correlation, okay? So this is one example, okay? So we have asset one return, asset two return, okay? Then we have uh, the the risk or standard deviation of um, of stock, standard deviation of bond, the correlation of those two, right? Do you guys remember uh, this function? Okay. So what we're gonna do is we are going to just change the weight of stock and the bond, and then calculate uh, different um, different risks for different combinations. Okay. So look. Column, uh, this is a portfolio weight, right? We have different combinations. Let's look at this one. Right here, you have 10% in stocks, right? 90% in bonds. And then right here, you have 90% in stocks, 10% in bonds, right? So that's different weight. So you put different amount of money in, in two assets, stock or bond, right? And then we all know can expect a return is just simply equal to the weight, right, times the return of those two. So it's this number. And then the standard deviation, we use a function, right, a while ago, and then calculate it. As we can see, the return changes, right, because stocks have a higher return, expected return than bonds. That's why you are going to have a higher um, portfolio return. However, because uh, stocks have larger standard deviation or risk than bonds, the risk also goes up. It's pretty intuitive and straightforward, so why it matters, okay? If you plot it, you will realize it's a curve, okay? It's not a straight line because we don't have perfect um, correlation. Then what becomes interesting is, look, like if we compare point here, right, point A and point B. So like they, they do have the same standard deviation, right? However, portfolio B or the combination B is a, a combination of weights, right? Combination B has a higher return. So what, what Mark Whiskey says is if 
given that mathematically that's true, uh, you shouldn't even invest in A at all. This is bad, right? This is bad because it gives you lower return while your risk is the same. So that's the whole idea. And also, it tells you if you compare B and C, right? It tells you if your um, choice is optimal in order to have a higher return, okay? You have to have higher risk. Is that making sense? So let's make mainly two takeaways from um from this. And then we have only two two assets, right? Stock and bond. What if you have three? Okay. So for each one, like A and B, right? Stock A and B, we can draw something like this. Stock E and F, we can draw something like this. And then stock B and C, we can draw something like this. Um. No, I, I wouldn't say it this way. I will change the label A and B, right? B and C, and then this should be A and C, okay? So basically, uh, you have two combinations, right? A, B, C. So for each combination, A, B, you can draw a curve, okay? And then B, C, you can draw another curve. A, C, you can draw another curve. It's different, all those are stock, right? Stocks, A, B, and C. Is that making sense? Then you can stack them together. That's when you get efficient frontier. Okay, so if you stack them all together, you are going to get a, a um, optimal curve, right, on the edge. Why this is optimal? If you compare anything here, like A and B, right, any portfolio on this line is better than anything below this uh, curve, right? Because just like we said, with the same risk, this has a higher return. And then uh, the whole idea is risk return trade off. It gives you investment opportunity set, uh, available portfolio risk return combinations. And then just because we have mean variance criteria, we, we follow this. You always want a higher return with the same risk, right? You always want the lowest risk with the highest return. So that's why we say portfolio A dominates portfolio B. If this is true, then this is also true. So, um, and then later they add a risk-free assets, right, to combine with this. Um, so which one has, this called a sharp ratio. We will talk about it, right? Um, so this is return, right, on y-axis, and then this is risk. You always want your return minus your risk, uh, or divided by your risk, okay? Return divided by your risk will be largest because you want this to be large, right? You want this to be largest and then you want this to be small okay so do you want this ratio to be high and then the return here is um, need, you need to adjust for risk-free rate that's why we have a we have intercept here because um, a risk-free return is the return everyone gets okay so essentially this is called a risk premium okay you need to uh, consider the risk-free rate. You need to subtract the risk-free rate from your expected return. So that's what it says, right? This is the risk-free return. This is your expected return. This is your standard deviation. And then this is the optimal risky portfolio. Okay. And then later, they move forward, right? Uh, to say, uh, originally, it's just math, okay? And then later, they realize um, maybe there are some uh, ideas behind, okay? So that's all about science, okay? Science needs theory. Um, math will give you some idea, but you still need I need to find out why. Okay, so that's why they come up with uh, the different types of risk: market risk, systematic risk, or non-diversifiable risk. Okay, um, most people just call it market risk. And then um, some people call it systematic risk. You need to understand it's non-diversifiable. Okay, so those are risk factors common to the whole economy. And then we have a uh, unique firm specific risk or diversifiable risk. Those are the risks that can be eliminated by diversification. So what does that really mean? So it means this, okay? Do you guys remember when we do the mass calculation, our standard deviation goes down, right? Or we have better trade-off. What they say is, look, you have two parts of risk. This is diversifiable, this is market risk. So what is market risk in general, right? Uh, like President Trump, Okay, of the United States. Um, whenever he tweets anything about the trade war, a lot of stock will go down. Okay, and not only Ch uh, U.S. stocks, uh, Chinese stocks, emerging markets, any country. Okay, if it's really bad news, people will worry about the global 
economy outlook, and then all the stocks will go down. That's uh, really, uh, that's considered market risk. What is a diversifiable risk? Um, I like to use Elon Musk, right? Uh, if you don't know, he's the CEO of Tesla. Also, he's the CEO of SpaceX. Okay. So the fact that he was uh, smoke, smoking marijuana during an interview um, in California, which is illegal, creates a lot of issue okay, for that company, just only that company, because he's just so important to that company. Investors um, can't get rid of risk and can't get rid of this risk by buying like other electrical auto automakers, right? If Tesla goes down, maybe other company will go up. Because of that, you will cancel each other off. Or you can just buy something else. Okay. So maybe by traditional GE, right? Because he's doing something crazy, people will think maybe the electrical car development will be delayed. And then maybe the traditional gasoline car should be, um, company should be valued more. Okay. So that can be called a diversifiable risk. So if you have more stocks, then when you allocate them correctly, your standard deviation or the total risk will go down because again total risk equals to market risk plus diversifiable diversifiable risk okay or from specific risk okay, if you do it right okay this would be eliminated and then you have only market risk that's why when you add more stocks you will drop until one point is that making sense? So this is the theory behind, okay? And then you can uh, always use historical data to, uh, to do asset allocation. You need to understand those covariance will change. And then you need to understand that our realized return uh, might not be equal to the historical average. So this is called a model risk, okay? We have a good model, right? Um, however, sorry, however, Mm, we all know all models are wrong, some are helpful, okay, so you need to be careful uh, doing it. And then that's uh, the lecturing part, um, I will just go directly, um, I will just close this and then uh, show you all um, something related uh, to it. So the uh, first thing I have is, um, is the original article, okay, uh, this is from um, Called a portfolio selection, Harry Markowitzki. I mentioned him several times, right? He did an article in 1952, okay, in Journal of Finance, which is the hardest journal to publish. And then, if you look at his writing, just a lot of math, but the whole idea is fairly simple, just like what we did, okay? You see, uh, this is uh, if you do all the ways mathematically, you will be able to get a he called football, okay? And then, as we mentioned, right, some part will be efficient look he has risk on the y-axis return on the x-axis right you want a lowest risk highest return so that's why you always pick this part of the curve okay if you just reverse it we are going to move it to the top again this is in 1952 and then people realize maybe we just need to flip it to uh to help us understand um, easier this is probably not a perfect figure okay and then it goes on on other things, but the whole idea is fairly simple. I just want to show you how it looks like, okay? And then the second thing would be uh, just basic illustration of a uh, concept we talked about today. Uh, the Excel spreadsheet will be available uh, in Blackboard, okay? So we have um, different scenarios, right? And then those are stock found, and then this bond found, right? We can calculate return, and then we can carry a standard deviation like we mentioned last time. And then if you just pull out the returns by cell, you can calculate correlation. So in Excel, you have a correlation function here. Or you can just plot it, right? You can see that it has some correlation, but it doesn't really have strong, perfect correlation. That's why we have 0 0.14. The correlation range from negative 1, which is perfectly negatively correlated, to 1, perfectly positively correlated, okay? And then we go, go go on to see, right, to see uh, if we invest 40% in stock fund, 60% in bond fund. So how do we calculate the, um, how do we calculate the portfolio of uh, portfolio um, standard deviation, right? You can do it multiple ways, okay. So you can see those are the return, right? You can just average to get the average return, and then you can just use standard deviation dot s, which is means sample, okay, to calculate standard deviation. 
and do the same thing for bond okay right and then we all know that for each month right your return of portfolio is just simply equal to 40 percent times this plus 60 percent times negative nine okay and then the second month third month fourth month right you have the monthly return and then you can also calculate it this way is that making sense and then you can also calculate the covariance of those two right what I'm gonna do next is I can uh, just change the weight, okay? As we mentioned a while ago, right? We can just do um, different combinations of the weight of in stock and bond, right? You can change the weight. Like right here, I have 10% stock, 90% bond, and then 90%, 10%. And then I do a lot of short positions. So let's just take a look at this line, okay? So basically, I'm linking the weight to the return here, right? This time this plus this time that would be your first month's return. This weight times your second month's return, okay? Second month portfolio return, and then um, you just do a standard deviation of those, and then you expect to return of those. And then you can just drag them all the way down, right? You can also use equations. So this is when you use uh, two asset portfolio uh, variance calculation equation. Shows that you give, you have the same. So this column of standard deviation calculated using Excel function is the same as uh, this part. We use math function. Uh, why we have math function? Because um, because a long time ago, I think computer power is not that good. That's why we always have mass um, functions. And then I think they're going to have less and less, right? And then you can just plot it, right? Just like we plot your risk versus return here. So return, risk. Does that make sense? Then uh, I, we choose another one, right? We choose um, balance fund, right? We are, we are trying to do a three asset uh, illustration here, right? We have, um, let me just plot, we have stock, bond, and then balanced, right? Balanced, which is, what is balanced? Sometimes we just combine some stock and bonds together and then it's just balanced. Again, those are all fun, right? That's why we have balanced fund. Um, and then we have three assets, right? So that's why we have uh, three combinations, okay? One combination, stock fund, another combination, stock and balance fund, balance fund, and then bond fund and balance fund, okay? Then we are going to do the weight just like what we did. You see that? And then we are going to plot, right? Plot three. You guys see that? And then you can always put them all together, right? This, this is the first plot. And this comes from the second plot, and then this comes from the third plot. If you stack them together, just like I uh, illustrated, right? You can just if you do this is only three, right? If you do it more, you can see that you will get an efficient frontier. I will upload this uh, into um, that board. Another thing would be um, let's just look at um, Python, okay? So this is another way to look at it for programming, okay? So uh, you import some library and then we have a data here. We have uh, so this is the data we use. Okay, we have many companies, right? All, we have all their price data. And now how can we um, how can we do an efficient frontier um, out of it? So we import it, right? The head give you what it looks like, right? And then we select Apple, Microsoft, S and P 500, Gold. Okay, as for assets we analyze. Okay. So if you analyze four, right, you have six type of combinations. That's why I'm, I'm not going to do it using Excel, right? You can, you can even select more, okay? So that's why uh, programming gets really uh, handy, right? And then uh, this line uh, calculates the return, okay? It's fairly easy to calculate return with some library in Python, and then you can just plot it. This is what Apple's return looks like, this gold, Microsoft, and then this SPY is an ETF of S&P 500. Again, we had a, a daily return. You just need to uh, analyze that, right? 252 trading days. This is a covariance matrix. And then uh, we need to um, assign weights, right? Remember in Excel, like right here, we have to manually drag, right? And it goes 10% at a time. In Python, you can do more, okay? We can just use this function, just randomize four weights for you, okay? You can see that? 
add up to one, right? And then those return times the weights, just like we did in Excel, this would be your annualized return, okay? So the code below shows using covariance matrix to calculate a covariance similar to the SA value calculation. So what it says is, um, if you understand matrix, okay, you have, um, let me just go to uh, Excel and then show you the, the basic function, okay. So what it says is, um, so if you have a weight, right, so this would be, um, and then this is a covariance matrix, right, and then you have, uh, so this is a 1 by n, right, 1 by n, 1 by n, and then 1 by 1, right, and then this will give you a covariance uh, calculation. This is a covariance matrix, okay, it's called, uh, sigma is called a covariance matrix, and then this is just a weight, okay. And then this is a transpose of weight. So uh, if you know what I'm talking about, that's good. If not, that's fine. Okay, you can always go back and uh, review those maths if you are interested. And then so this is how you calculate those. Um, those. Um, so this is a weight, right? And then you can this covariance, and then this is a square root. This is a standard deviation. Uh, another thing we use programming language for is we have, they have functions, okay? You can define a function, return, re you, this, this function will give you return at the end. Define a function, it will give you the standard deviation at the end. And then we can do 2,500 simulations, okay? And then you can plot it. You can see it, we have so many different dots. The only reason why we have color is we just want, we, the color is sharp ratio, okay? Basically, um, you guys, you guys can see anything on the on the edge is has deeper, warmer color, right? Because those are good because they have high sharp ridge. Okay, that's all I have for today. And I hope this helps. Um, thank you. And let me know if you have any questions.